Right. Good evening, everyone. Let us all be seated and remain calm. Yeah, so we're going to begin. Yeah, we're going to begin today's Bible class evening. Yeah. All right. Uh, okay. Yeah, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to our Bible class this evening. Uh, so before we before we start our lesson today, we're going to go with the uh, hymns. So the first hymn we will sing, hymn 230, I want to be a worker. So we will sing uh, stanza one and three. I want to be a worker for the Lord. I want to love and trust his holy word. I want to sing and pray and be busy every day in the vineyard of the Lord. I will work, I will pray in the vineyard, in the vineyard of the Lord. I will work, I will pray, I will labor every day in the vineyard of the Lord. I want to be a worker strong and brave. I want to trust in Jesus' path to save. All who will really turn happy home in the kingdom of the Lord. I will work, I will pray in the vineyard, in the vineyard of the Lord. I will work, I will pray, I will labor every day in the vineyard of the Lord. Next hymn, hymn 536. Oh, rather cross. We will sing the first, second, and the fourth stanza. On a hill far away stood an old rather cross. The emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners was slain. So I chant. Wish the old brother cross. Till my troll is at last I lay down. I will cling to the old brother cross. And exchange the Sunday for us now. Oh, that old brother cross, so despised by the world, as a wondrous attraction for me. For the dear Lamb of God left his glory above to bear it to Calvary. So I shall reach the old right of cross. Till my troll with at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rather cross. And change it someday for a crown. To that old brother cross, 
Maxim 564, there is sunshine in my soul. We'll sing all the three stanzas. There is sunshine in my soul today, more glorious and bright than those in any earthly sky. For Jesus is my light, for the sunshine is a sunshine. What a peaceful, happy moment rose. When Jesus shows his smiling face, there is sunshine in my soul. There is music in my soul today. To my king and Jesus listening, the songs I cannot sing. Oh, the sun shine, let the sun shine. What a peaceful, happy moment, true. When Jesus shows his smiling face. There is sunshine in my soul. There is gladness in my soul today. And hope and praise and love. For blessings which he gives me now. For joy still I know. Oh, the sunshine, bless the sun. Shine while the peaceful, happy moment rolls. When Jesus shows his smiling face, there is sunshine in my soul. All right, I'll get one last hymn before we have the opening prayer by Brother Kelvin. Uh, we'll sing him for a tree, stand up, stand up for Jesus. Uh, let us all stand up. Um, <laughs> right, and we'll sing the first, second, and the fourth, and then. Uh, stand up, stand up for Jesus, the soldiers of the cross. Lift high his royal banner. It must not suffer loss. From victory unto victory, this army shall be lead. Till every foe is vanquished, and Christ does not indeed. Stand up, stand up for Jesus. The trumpet call be forth to the mighty conflict in this his glorious day. Even the men now serve him against number foes. Let courage rise with. 
danger and strength to strength of hope. Stand not, stand not for Jesus, the strife does not belong. This day the noise of battle, the next the victor song. To him that overcome the life be with the King of Glory shall bring Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father in heaven, holy be the name, Father, we come before you, before the most holy, holy throne, the most holy and awesome presence, as we bring forth our petition to you, but most importantly, our exaltation to you and Almighty God and all loving God. A God that created this earth, this universe, and this galaxy. A God that shows shows his shows his love by sending his only Son and our and our Savior Christ Jesus to come down to this earth to die for our sins, even though we persecute our Lord and we are people who always sin against you and always always forget you, always forget of you. We're so grateful for the many things we enjoy. We're so grateful for this time that we're able to be in this premise as we have our uh, midweek Bible class, as we are about to proceed the next hour of Bible class, that will be our Bible teacher, Brother Adrian, as she shared to us on the second part of the, uh, of, as the, sec the second part of the, of the, of this, of the lesson, on the, on the lesson that you may grind the bonus of speech and clarity, clarity of speech as she shared to us. Father, be with us as uh, as listeners that we pray and ask for a heart of humility and an open heart as we listen to his lesson this evening. Be with us as we proceed on with our Bible class. Be Father, so we are reminded of brethren who are not with us here today that you today that you may grant them uh that, that you may, that your protective hands be upon them and you may keep them safe until we meet again in the next point of hour. This is our praying Christ we pray and us. Amen. All right. Um, good evening, brethren and friends. And I'm so glad to see all of you here. For those who are tuning in online, I'm also very happy and glad that you could join us in our Wednesday Bible class session. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to apologize. My cough has not been very kind to me, so my lesson might be punctuated with intermittent coughing. All right. That's out of the way. Let's begin. So this evening, we'll be continuing on our series about the Beatitudes. Specifically, the verse in Matthew 5, uh, sorry, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 4, which is, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Now, at first glance, the verse seems to be extremely contradictory, right? Mourning is a word that is usually associated with emotions of loss, regret, and sorrow. <clears throat> and on the other hand, the word blessed in this particular verse comes from the Greek word makarios, or the root word makar, which means fortunate or well off. Now, if I could just have all of you to do a simple mental exercise with me, just to get into the mindset of what it's like to mourn something. So if I could have everyone please close your eyes and just focus your thoughts on someone you deem who is very precious to you. This person could be a family member. Perhaps they could be a parent, a sibling. It could be your child. 
your spouse, someone you are currently in a relationship with. It could be a brother or sister in Christ, a childhood friend, or even your pet. Now, take a bit of a trip down memory lane. <clears throat> Imagine all the hardships you've been through together. Recall your fondest memories and how you've grown as a person thanks to their presence in your life. <clears throat> now, imagine waking up one day and getting the news that they're no longer there, that they've been ripped away from your life without any warning. <clears throat> perhaps you saw it coming from a mile away, or perhaps it was so sudden that you still can't believe it. And now there's a void, a sort of emptiness, a gaping hole in your life that you don't know how to fill. And it wasn't there before. Thank you for your participation. <clears throat> you may now proceed to open your eyes. Perhaps you're feeling a little heavy right now. Perhaps a little upset, more than a little upset. And those are some of the emotions that one goes through during the mourning process. And again, I'd just like to repeat that it's really quite difficult to mention the word blessed and mourning in the same sentence. Onto something slightly lighter. There are multiple things that a person can mourn, and definitely <clears throat> the loss of a loved one is one of the heavier things. But in reality, mourning is simply defined as feeling regret or sadness that is associated with the loss of something. And understanding what exactly it is that God wants us to mourn is a key for understanding <clears throat> this particular verse in the Bible. Now, I did make mention that there are many other things that we can mourn. So what can we mourn for? You can mourn for the fact that your favorite Netflix series is over. And now over the weekend, oh no, I have nothing to do. What am I going to kill two hours with? Or as Brother Andrew mentioned, you could mourn not being able to eat at Nando's or Sushi King as often due to the state that the economy is in. <clears throat> you could mourn the loss of a job. maybe. You own a massive well of cryptocurrency and its value plummeted over the weeks, leaving you with almost nothing. We're going to look at three examples of mourning in the Bible, <clears throat> as well as what events led up to the morning and what was the result of the morning. <clears throat> Spoiler alert, one of these three events is actually quite close to what God is expecting us to mourn about in Matthew 5, 4. The first example that we're going to look at can be found in the book of Esther. And this book in the Bible is a very interesting one. It centers around this lady named Esther and her efforts to save her people, the Jews, from a man named Haman and his evil plot to annihilate them all. <clears throat> so how did this plot come about? Well, Haman was a person who held a very high standing in the king's court. The Bible says that he had been promoted above all the princes who were with him. And the king had decreed that everyone, all the king's servants within the gate had to bow and to pay homage to Haman. This can be found in the opening verses of Esther chapter 3. Enter Mordecai, and Mordecai is Esther's cousin, the person who had practically raised her because she had no mother and father of which to speak of. He was a very devout Jew, and as a result, he would only worship God. Because of this, he refused to bow or to pay homage to Haman. And the king's servants reported the matter to him. So, being a person who 
was curious about what was going on, Haman went to meet Mordecai for himself. And true enough, Mordecai refused to bow to him. So what happened was that Haman was filled with wrath, but he would not be content to destroy Mordecai alone, for he knew of Mordecai's people, but all the Jews in the kingdom of Ahasuerus. <clears throat> so we'll see what um, Haman told King Ahasuerus. If a kind brother or sister could please help me read Esther chapter 3, verses 8 to 9. That's Esther chapter 3, verses 8 to 9. Thanks, Mr. Mac. <clears throat> so that is what King Haman said to Ahasuerus. And notice that he was very ambiguous because he didn't want the king to find out what he was up to. He just used the words certain people. And he played with his emotions by saying that, you know, they do not keep your laws. So there's no point for you to let them remain around. <clears throat> so the king had no reason not to trust Haman because as read earlier, uh, he was one of the highest up in the king's court. So he took his signet ring, which is as good as the royal seal, or which was the royal seal at the time, and gave it to Haman, <clears throat> along with the men and the resources to carry out the decree. And so letters were sent to all the provinces to kill, destroy, and annihilate the Jews. The mourning in this book happens in chapter 4 when the Jews came to learn of the decree. We we'll see earlier on in the chapter that Mordecai himself was distraught and desperate. And he was so um, in grief that he actually tore his own clothes. <clears throat> but what were the reactions of the other Jews? So <clears throat> in Esther chapter 4, verse 3, we read that there was great mourning upon the Jews with fasting, weeping, and wailing. And many lay in sackcloth and ashes. So interesting fact, for the act of mourning here, what they actually do is they, they give up their clothes, they opt to wear a gunny sack or karanguni, and, <clears throat> and they put ashes on their head as a sign of mourning. So long story short, despite the overwhelming odds that were stacked against them, the Jews remained steadfast in their faith to God. What happened? So Mordecai encouraged Esther to take action. And basically he wanted to erase Esther's uh, intent, any of Esther's intent to flee. And if I could get a kind brother or sister to read um, verses 13 to 14, please. So chapter four, verses 13 to 14. <clears throat> Esther chapter four, verse 13. Then Mordecai commanded to answer Esther, Think not with thyself that thou shalt escape in the king's house more than all the Jews. For if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time, then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. But thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed. And who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this? As this? Yes, thanks, Rock Kevin. <clears throat> so in the beginning, Esther had doubts, Esther had fears, because um, in order to speak in the king's court, you need um, some sort of a, a speaking stick. And at the time when she entered the court, the stick had never been passed to her. So she did not know whether she could do it or not. So Mordecai gave her a bit of tough love by saying, don't think that you can escape uh, just because you're in the king's palace. Eventually, you're going to suffer the fate of all the other Jews because God is with us. And if you remain silent at this time, um, relief and deliverance will still arise. But you and your father's house will perish. Who knows that you, know, you have been placed in this esteemed position in a kingdom just 
for a time like this. So what happened then? Emboldened and encouraged, Esther told Mordecai to gather the Jews in Shushan to fast for her for three days. And for the same three days, Esther and their maids would as well. Eventually, because of their faith in God, Haman met his end at the very gallows that he had built to hang Mordecai on. And while the decree to destroy the Jews could not be, could not be withdrawn, because it was made by the royal seal or the king's signet ring, the king issued another decree <clears throat> to permit the Jews who were in every city to gather together and protect their lives, and they could kill, destroy, and annihilate any forces of any people or province who would assault them. And this can be found in the verse 11 of chapter 8. So it seems like despite all the mourning, there was a happy ending for the Jews. Our next example does not end <clears throat> that happily. Um, so another instance of mourning can be found in the book of Luke chapter 18. And this is a story that is quite common and known to many. And in this case, Jesus was counseling a rich young ruler who had asked him how to inherit eternal life. And so Jesus told him the things that he should and he should not do. <clears throat> and verse 20 of Luke 18 reads, Do you know the commandments? Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor your father and your mother. And the ruler replied, and I would imagine confidently so, that he had kept all these things from his youth. But then... Jesus told him that he was lacking one thing and he had to sell everything to the poor and follow Jesus. And when he was told this, the ruler became sorrowful for he was very rich. And the word sorrowful in this verse comes from the Greek word perilupos and also means to grieve all around or to be intensely sad. <clears throat> The young ruler here had proven that he didn't really know himself. He thought that by following the law, he had possessed a love that fulfilled the law and one that did no harm to a neighbor. Romans 13.10 states that love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. However, Jesus wanted to prove to him that the love he had wasn't enough. That he was simply deficient. And as a result, he suggested that the young ruler renounce everything and accompany him in sacrifice. However, the young ruler found that he could not do so. He shrank back, not daring to face a simple life. <clears throat> and as a result, he never made it to the kingdom of heaven, or rather he didn't enjoy the promise of eternal life. The last example of mourning that we are going to look at in the Bible is in the book of Deuteronomy, and it is probably the most literal example of mourning being the death of Moses. Let's look at some context behind the event. Please turn with me to Numbers chapter 20. So that's the book of Numbers in chapter 20. <clears throat> And here, Moses is leading the Israelites into the wilderness of Zin. And after what can be imagined as a very long period of traveling, the congregation was craving water. And so once again, because in this journey of numbers, one of the best things that the congregation was doing well was to complain, despite being punished by God multiple times already. So they contended with their leaders once again. Moses and Aaron, and they said they wished that they had died when the rest of their brethren died before the Lord. So Moses and Aaron went into the tabernacle and fell on their faces, and they spoke to the Lord. And the Lord told Moses to speak to a nearby rock in order to draw water. However, <clears throat> Moses had become impatient and very understandably angry and upset at the commands of the Israelites. 
And instead of speaking to the rock, he raised his staff and he struck it. And he said, Hear now, you rebels. Must we bring water for you out of this rock? As a result, <clears throat> in verse 12, the Lord says, Because you did not believe me, to hallow me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this assembly into the land which I have given them. This statement is repeated once again in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 32, in verses 48 to 52. And here, the Lord is telling Moses that he is to die on Mount Nebo, reminding him of his trespass and telling him that he would see the land given to the children of Israel, but he would not be able to enter. His actual death takes place two chapters later in Deuteronomy 34. And although he was 120 years old when he died, the Bible states that his eyes were not dim, nor his natural vigor diminished. In verse 8, it says that the children of Israel wept for him in the plains of Moab for 30 days. And verses 10 to 12 are a sort of tribute to Moses and one and a reason or reasons why they might have mourned him. And verses 10 to 12 read, but since then, there has not arisen in Israel a prophet like Moses from whom the Lord knew face to face in all the signs and wonders which the Lord sent him to do in the land of Egypt before Pharaoh, before all his servants and in all his land. And by all that mighty power and the great terror which Moses performed in the sight of all Israel. <clears throat> so we've seen three different types of mourning in the example so far. One in which the Jews mourned for the fate of their people against the decree of a tyrannical leader. One where an individual mourned his ability, uh, sorry, his disability to part with his earthly wealth. And as a result, he was unable to follow Jesus Christ and unable to inherit eternal life. And the last example, where the Israelites mourned the passing of a great leader, one who led them out of slavery, out of bondage, to the precipice of the promised land. But because of his trespass, he was not allowed to enter. Among these three examples, the one that resonates the closest to the verse that we are looking at today is the second one, the example of the young ruler. Now what Jesus was telling the people to mourn here is for the evils of our own heart, our capacity to fall into temptation and also for the sin and sorrow surrounding us. So what does it mean <clears throat> by God, I'm sorry, God wants us to mourn sin? The first statement in the blessing on the, in the Sermon on the Mount was blessed were those who were poor in spirit. The lesson who was taught by Brother Kai last week. These are people who recognize their sinfulness. They see that, they see their own sin, and they know that they require God, and only God can give them redemption from this sin. They are the people, instead of boasting about all the good things they've done, they just say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. So let's consider for a moment, what is it that separates us from God? It is our iniquities. It is the sins that we commit. It is those acts that doom us to an eternity away from God. And therefore, it's only logical to come to the conclusion that God wants us to mourn over our sin because it is the one thing that can separate us from God. <clears throat> this is the kind of mourning that God desires of us, of his people. And I want to take a look at some similarities that Isaiah 61 has to the Beatitudes. So Isaiah 61 is a prophecy about the coming Messiah, about Jesus, as well as what he would do. So I'm going to read Isaiah 61, verses 1 
to three. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord had anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to, procre to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of our Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to console all those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. Notice that the verses say that, the, that Christ has come to heal the brokenhearted and to comfort all who mourn. And once again, true mourning focuses on what we have done to God. Because every time we sin, we have violated his very nature. Because we know that we are beings who were made in his image. We mourn because of separation from God due to our sins. I'm going to touch on a few faithful people of God who mourn their sins. Sorry, shortly. So, what can we take away from this? It's important to constantly be reflecting on ourselves as well as our behavior. We need to question ourselves. <clears throat> Are we always putting our best foot forward when it comes to acting godly? Or are we doing just enough to slip under the radar? Just enough to get by? Are we constantly trying to grow in the faith? Or are we happy enough to stagnate and let other people surpass us? And to let them do God's work for us? Think about the example of the rich young ruler earlier. And how he was already holding to a number of godly values. As far as people on earth would, concern, uh, would be concerned, even by today's standards, they would probably think of him as a very fine, upstanding young man, a being of good character, and boasting a very sizable fortune to boot. So a successful man who perhaps uh, takes on 99% of the values that God wishes us to take on. However, it is that remaining 1% his attachment to his material wealth that became a barrier to his spiritual progress, one that he could not sever. What are the barriers in our personal lives that we are failing to sever? Could it be a job that pays well, but does not give you any room to attend church or Bible class regularly? <clears throat> Perhaps it's a pastime or activity that is competing for priority with assembling with the congregation. Identifying these barriers is easy enough, but taking the next step to halt them, to cease them altogether, is where it starts to get challenging. It takes perseverance, discipline, faith, and the willingness to admit and overcome any mistakes that you have committed. Last Sunday, I sat in the Sunday school class with Sister Jolene. And one of the highlights of the class is when she was giving a prelude to the book of Acts. And in it, she was comparing two people who had sinned against God. One was Judas and the other was Peter. As we all know, one of them betrayed Jesus, leading to his arrest, unfair trial, crucifixion, and the other denounced him three times. Yes, you could argue that there is definitely a difference in magnitude causing Christ's earthly death and denouncing him three times. But the fact of the matter is that both of them had sinned against God. Both of them had gone against God, had gone against Christ. However, although both of them show intense regret for their actions, one of them, Judas, went to return the silver and it was not accepted back by the soldiers because they didn't need it anymore. And so because he couldn't handle the guilt, he chose to take the easier way out 
and he ended his own life. He never even tried to use the guilt as a motivator to rectify his actions. On the other hand, Peter never gave up his duties even after being reduced to tears once he realized the severity of his actions. And in John chapter 21, after Jesus was risen again, Jesus restored Peter, this time asking him three times if Peter loved him. And Simon Peter said yes three times. And so Jesus entrusted him with the duty of feeding his sheep. <clears throat> As members of God's family, we also have the responsibility of helping one another reflect and to realize each other's shortcomings. A fantastic example of this is Paul in the book of 1 Corinthians. So in Paul's first episode to the brethren at Corinth, he talks to them about behaviors to be corrected. For example, in chapter 3, he addresses divisions within the church. In chapter 5, he addresses sexual immorality. And in chapter 6, he addresses the issue of lawsuits within the brethren. However, I would like to highlight the first two verses of chapter 5, which actually have the word mourning. <clears throat> so 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 and 2 read, It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, and such sexual immorality as is not even named among the Gentiles, that a man has his father's wife, and you are puffed up and have not mourned that he who has done this deed might be taken away from you. So he contrasts puffed up or being arrogant, being full of themselves, instead of mourning the fact that they had transgressed the word of God. But then, what does Paul decide to do towards the end of Corinthians? He decides to encourage them by preaching love and telling them about the resurrection of Christ. So this is good. Because after giving them a tongue lashing, after pricking their hearts, he's lifting their spirits. But what makes things interesting is, in his follow-up <clears throat> to the letter, <clears throat> he revisits the topic at hand. So in chapter 7 of 2 Corinthians, and depending on the Bible you use, um, I'm using the NKJV, and there is a subheading for verses to 12, and it is titled, The Corinthians' Repentance. Verses 8 to 11 <clears throat> read as such. For even if I made you sorry with my letter, I do not regret it, though I did regret it. For I perceive that the same epistle made you sorry, though only for a while. So what does it mean here? He did prick their hearts. He did make them regret but they did not wallow in it. It only happened for a while. And what's the follow-up? In verse 9, he says, Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that your sorrow led to repentance. For you were made sorry in a godly manner, that you might suffer loss from us in nothing. For godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation, not to be regretted. But the sorrow of the world produces death. So observe this very thing that you sorrowed in a godly manner. What diligence it produced in you. What clearing of yourselves. <clears throat> what indignation. What fear. What vehement desire. What zeal. What vindication. In all things, you proved yourselves to be clear in this matter. It's clear here that Paul's actions had made the church realize their wrongdoings and how their transgressions were going against the word of God. Again, he realized that in making them aware, he had pricked their hearts. He had made them sorry, <clears throat> but he had absolutely no regrets because his chiding had resulted in repentance and as a result, positive change. In a nutshell, as Christians, God has expectations of us that we have to live up to as beings made in his image. Self-awareness is one of the key values that we have to cultivate in order to live a godly life. And building 
on the self-awareness is the realization that we are imperfect beings. And so it's important for us to mourn the fact that we are not perfect and work through life and do our best to rectify these imperfections as best we can so that we do not cause God grief. I'd like to close by saying that it's definitely a difficult journey. And we know example, we know many examples of people in the Bible who were strong in the faith, but they made mistakes. But the takeaway here is that even though you made mistakes, even though you may stumble and fall, that you can get back up again. No matter what, no matter when, it's never too late. And also, most importantly, we're not alone because we have our loving Father watching over us and we have each other to support every step of the way. So <clears throat> that brings me to the end of the lesson. And I've prepared a few sharing prompts to facilitate discussion. Now, I realize that the sharing prompts might be a bit personal. So if you want to share a story about a brother or a sister, um, feel free to keep it anon anonymous. But my intention for this sharing is for us to learn and for us to um, encourage one another. So number one, share an instance where you overcame an obstacle which resulted in spiritual growth. How do you come to realize the existence of this, ob of this obstacle? What help did you receive? What did you learn in the process? Number two, share an instance where you helped a fellow brother or sister overcome a spiritual roadblock. Now, again, if you want to respect anonymity, that's perfectly fine. How did you broach the topic with them? Was any tough love necessary? And what did you learn in the process? Number three, how can we get better at talking about topics of spiritual growth within the brethren? How do we strike a balance between encouraging someone and chiding them? I suppose I should add to the point of being disheartened. So now I'm going to open to the floor and uh, please take some time to think and share your thoughts. Maybe I'll, go, I'll, answer, I'll share on the third one now. The third one. Okay. The third one first. How okay, can we get better at uh, talking about spiritual growth of brethren is to talk. I mean, to really talk about spiritual growth and spiritual matters because let's, because let's face it, we all, when we all meet, we all, when we all meet most of the time, most of the topics will be about current day issues like like just the, the past two weeks, the past two weeks, uh, prime ministers and, and, and we will talk about prime ministers of, of different countries being stepped uh, step down or, or being assassinated or we talk about what's the latest, what's our favorite, uh, favorite anime or favorite TV show that we, 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 we talked about our favorite TV series. That means what I'm trying to say is that most of the time we always talk about every other thing except spiritual growth or our, our, our spiritual health. Uh, I would say that I think it's, it's high. It's, it should be the case that for all of us, be it, uh, especially those, I'm not saying that we should, I'm not putting pressure on people who are older in the faith or in the church longer, but those who have in, those in the church longer, especially the young, I, I, I was thinking from a young adult, we should really start to talk about uh, spiritual matters and be, I would say be aware of everybody's spiritual health. Okay. We we shouldn't be oh one day one fine we we shouldn't have that surprise that oh one with one day that we all we will go to church normally one day you do, you don't hear this brethren anymore or they don't come then then I think it's a very it's a, it's a very too late really but at at the point of time so how do we strike a balance I think. How do we strike a balance? It's more like uh, you have to. We have to know the person now. Uh. We have to know the person. Uh, we have to know person personally as well as spiritually to 
to encourage them because uh, effective encouragement, like I said, is that we need to know the situation they're in. And if both of us know, what I believe is that if both of us, we all hang out a lot, we all will know what is our characteristic like. So if let's say I were to uh, criticize them or I were to maybe give them some tough love, they will know that they will know that this is of tough love and I, they want they want me to 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 learn to learn now. Because I'll, I take example of like, if let's say someone in church who I really talk I already talked to suddenly tell me that something that tell me and uh, point out my thoughts of me, I take it very seriously because uh, this person have never I have not communicated much, but she is she's willing to 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 point out my mistakes. I think that is the more to me a more severe notific not, notification to me. Yeah. All right. All right. Thank you for the answer. So basically, <clears throat> is to spend time with one another, grow close with one another and uh, approach spiritual topics more often, as well as keep each other in the loop, right? And this helps to track spiritual progress of anyone who might be falling out. Or, and at the same time, we establish a comfort zone where we are not afraid to share, to, to point out if someone um, is stumbling. Okay, thank you for your detailed answer, Brother Kelvin. Yes, yes. Yes. Tess, is it working? Yes. Oh, it's yes. okay. Um, I, I actually like uh, Brother Kelvin's answer quite a lot. Um, when you talk about how can we get better at talking about topics of spiritual growth, one of the things that I find about talking about not just spiritual growth, but any spiritual in general, sometimes it's just confined to a, a Wednesday thing or a Sunday thing. We... We need to get better at normalizing, asking people, you know, like the most common greeting that people say isn't like, hello, goodbye. It's like, have you eaten already? Yeah? Or like, you know, like, oh, what do you have for dinner? Or, you know, like, how's breakfast today? Or something like that, you know, that's that's more common than, that's more common than asking somebody, how was your Bible study this week? How was your prayer life this week? Or, you know, like, what challenges do you face that I can help you out uh, in the past week? Or you remember that somebody is going through a difficult time and you follow up with them like it. So I just find that we don't normalize these conversations as much as we we should. Um, just asking somebody, you know, like, hey, how how's your Bible reading this week? That kind of thing. And once we start doing that, we don't confine these topics to just Wednesday night and Sunday morning when these are dedicated times to talk about these things. Yeah. So maybe just a, a, a follow-up on the second part of the question as well, striking a balance between encouraging someone and chiding them. Maybe if I can go off tangent a little bit, uh, sometimes we need to also provide people a, a very comfortable space to open up and share. Not all the time we, you know, we have brethren that are close to somebody to hear their, their concerns. Um, you know, the, the young adults have a not so secret group a uh, couple of months back or a couple of years back called uh, Theology Thursdays. Uh, uh, we used to talk about all kinds of things over there. You know, it's a safe space for young adults to come out and, and say stuff like, I really don't understand why the church is against the homosexual agenda. I really don't understand why, uh, you know, like I cannot go and protest on the street, you know, like things like that. Uh, like, so it's a safe space for people to come out and share and nobody there is going to say, that. how can you say this kind of thing? You know, like, don't you know you're a Christian? You should read the Bible, blah, blah, blah. Romans chapter 1 say this. Oh, okay. you know, then there, there is no space for learning if there is no space for us to hear each other out. Yeah. So I think creating the environment is important. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Bro. Uh, shameless plug. Theology Thursday is going to be rebirthed soon. Okay. Yeah, well, I was waiting for that. I was wondering what the plug was. All right. Um, thanks, bro, Elvin, uh, for resonating with bro, Kelvin, as well. So... We take a check, yeah, this Sunday when we, when we makan together, there must at least be two or three spiritual topics. Okay, I'll hold that to you guys. Oh, why not? We just do it after Bible class now. Okay, no, so, no problem. So there's an invitation to supper, right? All right, feel free to join us, anyone who wants. <laughs> All right, Um, I actually want to ask Bro Eng, because, you know, I it, it's no secret that um I faced my share of spiritual obstacles. And in one of them, I went to Bro Eng for advice. And he really kasi me kau kau. So I just want to know, bro, and you know, with relation to question three, what was on your mind during that time when you heard about where I was and are you, what is this, what is this fella doing? 
perhaps you can share. <clears throat> I I forgotten. Okay, well, in a way, it's not a bad thing because it wasn't so bad, right? No, I I, I don't. Can you hear me? I can, can. I, I don't recall me as uh, being harsh as in in a in the harsh manner. Firm, uh, firm. Ah, uh, firm. Uh, firm. Okay. <laughs> uh, for me, it's it's the reality of situation as I explain mm -hmm. it, and what our personal responsibility is in any situation, whether it is. To the job, to to the employer, uh, and also to ourselves. Okay, a lot of times when when we are in a spot, it is because uh, we have overlooked one of these personal responsibilities. So it's a matter of bringing it to awareness. Sometimes you know when 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 it prick our heart, then we feel a bit more stuck it lah. But but yes, yes. The, the intention is actually a very how to put it a very objective one in in helping uh, a brother understand mm -hmm. where they can perhaps improve yeah Understood. yeah thanks Ryan. yeah don't worry it's not a color it, a, a lot of good came from it <laughs> uh yes uh, yeah i would like to give my input on question two and three yeah okay yeah so uh, how we approach the topic with them. Uh, uh, so uh, first, of course, uh, we, do, we I don't dive into straight away talk to them about spiritual thing. Huh? So um, uh, and the person uh, to help a person to overcome uh, spiritual roadblock, we first we uh, check, uh, try to understand the person um, situation, huh? his life, uh, his situation. What challenges that uh, he faced in his life, uh, mm. uh, uh, whether work challenges. Uh, um, then uh, from there, then it roughly gives us a rough uh, uh, idea uh, why uh, the person in that spiritual situation. Right. Uh, that's it, spiritual situation. Mm. So uh, then uh, after we understand that, so although uh, we love uh, the brethren, uh, love the brethren, so at the same time, as you put that tough love, huh? so yet we have still have to highlight, uh, highlight uh, what need to be corrected, uh, to strike a balance, uh, huh? Then, uh, uh, before we talk about uh, the lower, uh, lower strength, uh, just now I have a conversation with uh, Nat 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 uh, in the hospital uh, where his father is about to admit to uh, uh, SGMC. Uh, so he talked about he need his, his in, in his interview. EY, uh, the company didn't use the word uh, weak, what is your weaknesses? Uh, use lower strength. <laughs> so we talk about his lower strength uh, uh, in his spiritual uh, area. So actually, uh, first I look at uh, uh, the spiritual strength, huh? mm. uh, what is encouraging, mm. then they highlight to him, uh, actually, uh, you have been doing this in the church, you are doing well, uh, uh, even though to you it might be minor, huh? mm. but uh, to us it's uh, significant, huh? your contribution, huh? <clears throat> this you can do, this what you, uh, we are skilled, we are talented, this, uh, you, are, you are doing something. Huh? Uh, so from there, at the same time, we, we tell the person uh, uh, what need uh, uh, more effort need to put in this uh, area where they are uh, lacking uh, uh, where they are lacking uh. so uh, so there's a positive thing uh, to encourage them then at the same time highlight to them uh, uh, need to put in more effort in certain area uh. so um, by doing uh, how so in question uh, continue with the question three you want to answer some of it how can we get better at talking about topic of spiritual growth with the brethren? Huh? So I find that uh, through this process, of, as we continue to reach out to brethren, uh, because we must uh, have courage huh, uh, and have wisdom to reach out to them. So as we continue to do that, it help, definitely it helps us huh, to get better, huh, to get better. Huh? 
Then at the same time, in the process, we also learn how to reach out to people. And uh, when we tell someone to do some, uh, to improve on something, then at the same time, this process will help us to we make sure that we are the person who are, who are leading by example. Huh? <coughs> yeah, thanks. Right. Thanks for the answer, Roshankun. All right. Um, anyone else? Oh, yes, ladies. Thank you. Uh, I want to share number three. Okay. Um, I recently talked to Sister Hazel, and then uh, we were in the car, and then um, she, we were talking about spiritual topics. So it started very simple, like she just asked, uh, what's your favorite character in the Bible? And then, yeah, it just gets flowing. And then uh, I learned from the previous YF, it was a topic about fellowship. So I learned that fellowship is not just socializing, it's working together towards something. Let's say you are uh, right now, uh, me and Nathaniel are uh, studying with Jong. So this is, I guess, a fellowship because we are working with uh, together. So um, I think when we are working towards a goal, we the topics about spiritual growth just naturally comes. It's not just a uh, hey, how are you and what how's your day and you can talk about oh, how's the uh what uh how's Jong doing and what can we do to to be better in our Bible studies. So when I think yeah I think fellowship is something that we can establish something and then we work towards that and that will like, encourage spiritual topics. Okay, yeah. Thanks, Chris. I think that it's true. Um, as long as we have a common destination, it's definitely way easier to unite and come together to do something. Yep. <clears throat> yes, Sister Chris. Um, I want to share the number two one. Mm. I don't know whether is it suitable for me to mention the brother. <laughs> the name, don't need to mention the name. Don't need to, to mention, mention the name. Uh, yeah, because I think um, I'm not saying that um, I'm still learning. I'm still learning actually to I think uh, as a as a brother Chankun and what I was sharing earlier on, I think is I think first of all how to actually help a brother or sister. I think my personal experience I think is to build relationship. Of course, building relationship is two way traffic as I as I mentioned, it's like two two hands have to clasp together, no matter how hard you try, but the other party is not lying you though, so you can't do much. So I think constantly seeking for opportunity. And I think my advice, personal experience as advice, is like you aim for the person and then try if you can commit, you commit yourself, but not expecting the other person to commit. But through throughout the throughout the progress and the opportunity along, I mean, along the way in the process, uh, along the way that the, this brother have in the normal conversation, they get to, I caught him attention, say that, oh, can you have a Bible reading with me every night? Mm. So happened that every night I will call him at the beginning, slowly mm. he the one who called me. So, and then along the way, then we get Bible study and through that, I think through that progress is how a person can, I mean, and then with that relationship bond, then he know you are sincere. Mm -hmm. So when tough love have to come in place, uh, then they won't talk, take offense, offensive, mm -hmm. offended. So then they they see you are mean, you mean it. So I think there will be high percentage of they take your advice i think yeah this is my right thanks for the sharing sister chris i think it resonates well with uh bro kelvin and bro Chankun's points one is to build a bond first and then the other is to lead by example and then once you have established a very good example then you are in a position to tell people oh you know i think that um your relationship with god could be improved in these ways and if they see you shining then they will be more um convinced to follow your example and less offended uh, when you are sincerely pointing out their faults. Anybody else? Oh. 
Okay, so if there is nobody else to share, I will take my leave. Thank you for your attention and we can have the closing prayer. Thanks, man. Please join me in prayer. Our oh, gracious God in heaven, we are so thankful for your many blessings that you bestowed upon us. We thank you for being our strength and our shield, and we thank you for loving us. Father, we are so grateful for the holy word that you have um, preserved for us within the pages of our Bible, so that we can learn about you, your commandments, and your plan of salvation for us. Father, we are thankful for Brother Adrian, who has shared a lesson with us uh, from the passages of this scripture. Pray that you will bless Brother Adrian with wisdom as he grows in knowledge and his faith in you. Father, I pray that all of us will continue to study your word diligently with understanding. And may our life here on love glorify your name. Be you first and bless us um, as, uh, for the rest of the week and as we come together again on Sunday to worship you. All these things we pray for in the name of Jesus. Amen. Church would like to thank Brother Adrian for the good effort they have put in to prepare a lesson to encourage us. Uh, uh, we also want to thank, uh, we have visiting brethren with us, uh, uh, Sister Chris from Klang. We are, we are glad to see Sister Poiting back with us. Uh, so smiling. Uh, so recover fully, I uh, hope uh, recover from influenza. Uh, <clears throat> um, next Wednesday, um, Brother Jonas C will be teaching uh, with the title, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Uh, then uh, this uh, coming Saturday, this coming Saturday, there will be Young Adult Fellowship. It's a outing, late recreation at Putra Jaya. I think Brother Wong Kai had uh, sent out the list of uh, those who want to participate. Uh, that include our guest speaker, but, um, Brother Ernest and his uh, family also will be joining the outing to Putra Jaya uh, Kanoing. Uh. So this coming Saturday, Brother uh, Sunday, sorry, Brother Ernest Lau will be taking two lessons. Uh, for the Bible study class, he'll be sharing um, Timothy, the young evangelist. Uh, then for the sermon, he'll be sharing the impact of our choices on our eternal destiny. Uh, so Brother Ernest will be uh, uh, with us uh, during this weekend. So I, I just told Brother uh, Elvin uh, to uh, put up a list so that we, uh, as we hope Brother will, will uh, take, uh, make effort and time to host Ernest and family uh, for mail. Uh. So um, let us not just leave it, leave it to the family that host them for accommodation and do all the work. Uh. So please uh, uh, lie with my brother Evin or brother Evin after I told him to put up the list, uh, the slot available so that uh, members can take the opportunity to um, host them and fellowship with them. Yeah? So these, uh, these brethren, um, even though uh, with good qualification, uh, having a good job yet, take up full-time job, so we can learn much from him. Uh, so by spending time with them, chit-chatting, uh, talking with them, we can learn much from this uh, uh, young evangelist. Uh, so um, <clears throat> that's, uh, that's all from my end. So uh, have, have a, <coughs> so we shall dismiss us. Uh.